Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the boardroom. Today we have a special show because this is something I've sort of wanted to do a long time. We're going to talk about Tigris and Euphrates, uh, a Mayfair release. Uh, rather new for Mayfair. It's been around uh, for a little bit in Europe. Uh, this one is uh, designed by Dr. Reiner Knizia, and fortunately he's on the phone with us from England, and I can't thank him enough for appearing. How are you, Reiner? I'm very well, and I'm very glad to be on the show. Well, this is exciting for me because we're going to really take some time and look into this game. We're going to do our normal demonstration for the first show, and then in subsequent shows, uh, to the tune of maybe two or three or four shows, we're going to talk about some of the more advanced strategies, uh, some of the design tips, and uh, different things you went through on uh, your, your uh, quest to design this game. Uh, basically, again, it's a Mayfair Games release in this country. It's two to four players. Uh, I've only played it with four players. Reiner can fill us in a little bit more on the rest of it. Ages 12 and up, and I, it's taken us maybe an hour to two hours to play each game. Uh, does that sit pretty well with you, Reiner? Yes, uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, and I think if you have only played it with four players, let, let, me, let me just make this one remark. Uh, it is a very good two-player game as well, because sometimes if you look at multiplayer games, uh, they sometimes do not really work with a two-player game. The lucky thing, I want to say it like this, the lucky thing with uh, Tigris and Euphrates is it really works as a very nice strategy game for two players. Reiner, a lot of people consider this your, your best game. And in fact, some people, and quite a few people I've talked to in the past several months, consider this one of the best games ever done. Do you look back on this game with a special fondness? I, I know when I talk to you, you just seem very excited about it. It, it has a special meaning for me, mainly for one reason, because it is probably my most complex game I have done so far. Uh, there's a lot of uh, energy in there. There is a lot of effort in there as well. Uh, and with this respect, I'm very, very proud of it. And, I, and this is also my interpretation why some people like that most of my games, because that's probably the group of people who like the more complex strategic games, and they probably found something which they like in, in Tigris and Euphrates. Well, that said, I have to tell you, I've had no trouble teaching this to people that do not play this type of game. I have had no trouble getting them to play it, and they have found it rather uh, satisfying to play. So I don't put this into the category that some people do as a much harder game, but we'll give them a chance to make that decision themselves. I, I guess we'll probably come onto this topic later, but... Uh, one of, of the key objectives when I design a game is to have relatively simple rules, but from these rules then make sure that a very deep game can develop. So that means a, a casual player can find his, uh, his way into the game relatively easily and can enjoy the game, but the more people play it, the more they see the depth, and that means even if you have played it 50 times, 100 times, even if you are a, a good and sophisticated game player, you will see all the depth in there, but it's, it's this this challenge for me to make it on these two levels, easy entry, but then very, very big development. Well, this one works uh, exactly in that area. Let's, let's start off then with uh, the theme and the setting. Uh, why don't you run us through some of that? Yes, I mean, as the title already says, Tigris and Euphrates uh, uh, leads us into Mesopotamia, but not in our time, but more than 5,000 years ago when uh, civilization, human civilization started on Earth. And that was around Tigris and Euphrates and in Turkey, as we know. And it's, it's a very, very fascinating theme, which, um, which I wanted to do for a very long time. And finally, I started doing it. And it's, it's really about um, how mankind settles down, how they uh, develop culture from this uh, nucleus uh, around Tigris and Euphrates, because you... What you need, of course, if you settle down, is you need uh, a reasonable developed agriculture because otherwise you can't feed the people. And, of course, you need to, feed, you need to have people if you want to settle and if you want to build a kingdom. Uh, but that alone doesn't, doesn't do it. I think you need to have a good, good structure in your society. And as we now know, religion was a, a very, very important factor in the organization of society. So I built this in. And finally, it's also about a fourth dimension, which I think was enormously important for the development of civilization and culture, that is trade. And I put these four elements in there, 
and essentially I put each player into the role of a dynasty. So you are a family or a dynasty, and you try to prosper with your family in this region through the development of settlements and of the culture as described. Now, the, as, you are, as you are a family, you are not a single person represented on the board, but you are representing four leaders. And each of the four leaders that you are guiding is actually a specialist in one of the four areas I just named. So that is one is the king, the other one is a priest, the third is looking after the agronomy, the, the farming side, and the fourth one is a trader or a merchant. Uh, so that means you have the different qualities and you try to bring these different qualities into the game uh, and to try to be successful. That means you will have certain kingdoms. Now one trick in the game, which I'm very proud of, is you're not building a kingdom by yourself where you and your family members are all in the same group. Mm. What you're doing is you're having a king, your king, in one kingdom, and then maybe your priest is on the other end of the board, and he's joining another kingdom and tries to build an own city and an own development there uh, under another king, for example. Uh, so you, it's a lot of interaction in there because you can either try to be by yourself or you can try to mingle with the others, and it has all its advantages and disadvantages. Well, I think in early games that I have observed, and I've watched quite a few, uh, people seem to, to isolate in the first time they play it, where they'll keep all their kings or all their uh, leaders in one land mass. Uh, but, but as you play the game more, I think you'll find it's much richer to, to move around and uh, experiment. You're absolutely right. I mean, the, the safest strategy in the beginning, maybe not the best and the optimal strategy, but the safest strategy in the beginning is you stay in one corner, stay for yourself. This is my little kingdom. It's small, but it is mine, and I make sure that nobody else comes in because all relevant <laughs> positions are occupied by my people. This well, that, is something that, that you have the least consequences, so it's nice, you, it's nice to see what is going on. The complexity starts, of course, if you start to interact with others and go into other kingdoms, and then all sorts of, of effects happen, which we are going to discuss uh, uh, in, in one of the next episodes, of course. Well, precisely. Uh, that's, that's a real good start, so let's uh, now cover some of the components. We've got three cameras set up, so hopefully the viewers will be able to see this very clearly. Uh, why don't you start us off where you like, and I'll try and follow. I mean, absolutely clearly, if we talk about a strategic game about settlement, we need a board. We have a big board in front of us, uh, which essentially shows the Tigris and Tophetes and Mesopotamia in between and on the edges. Uh, the other very important um, component in the game are lots of tiles. We call them mainly civilization tiles, and you see them already scattered over the board. Uh, and they represent these four areas, which I mentioned so the people and the king and then uh, the, the priests and the temples and then the agronomy along the rivers and finally the traders which are uh, represented in green. That's the two main components. Uh, there are screens for the players because you want to hide your tiles which you play. You also want to hide the scores you make. There are scoring pieces in there which are uh, little wooden cubes. Um, and uh, that's uh, about it. Well, the main thing with uh, this game that I found was everything is color-coded. So if you're talking red, you're talking about the church or yep. the temple. And everybody has a leader in each area. Yep. So just always remember everything ties to the colors. If it's blue, it is along the river, and it has to deal with farming. The green is very important for trade. The king handles the black part. Uh, when you see the tiles, they match up exactly the same. So the game makes complete sense, uh, and it's very easy to sit on one side of the board and view everything very clearly without having to get up and move. Absolutely, uh, and this is also important to see that you as a player are not playing a color. You are not a color. You are a family, and you have a leader in each of the colors. So you are represented by one of the symbols, as you see them as the archer symbol, for example, because the leaders are uh, the little uh, round wooden pieces. So you see the archer symbol in the respective colors on there, and one player plays all the archers, another player, for example, plays all the bullheads, or uh, another plays the lion, or the potter. Exactly, and, and once you recognize that, this game is very easy to learn, I must say. Uh, again, strategy-wise, we're going to spend some time on that. Okay, so now we, we've gotten to the point where we understand the pieces and the setting, 
what what is the basic role of each player outside of owning the dynasty and being uh, in charge of the dynasty? What are the objectives that he's trying to reach? The objective is, of course, he wants to be the most successful player in building civilization, building the culture. Now, I think what is very important in the civilization, in the development of it, is that you have an enormous harmony and a balance between the different forces in there. And therefore, your objective is not to be very good in religion or very good as a king or a very good merchant. Your objective is to be good in all of these things. And that means you will afterwards, at the end of the game, be scored according to your lowest achievement. That means we look at the different players, and if one player has been particularly weak in, in, in being the merchant, then this is his score. And if the other player has been particularly weak on the religious side, then the religion will be his score. So that means always the weakest side, the, the, the where you are uh, the least developed, that's what you did, because that's, it's, it's essentially the weakest uh, part of the chain uh, which we are measuring here, and so you always need to develop this side, and you can't be satisfied with having very good developments in some areas. You always need to look at the weak, weak areas and bring these up. Exactly, and we're going to spend a lot more time on that uh, yeah. when we get to scoring. Okay, now we have a lot of, uh, and I'm sure the people are looking at this, there's a lot of different regions on the board. Yeah. How does this relate, or what's the difference between a region and a kingdom? Yes. Uh, essentially, as you already said, the game, the basic game rules are very, very simple. When it's your turn, you either place leaders or you place tiles, and you may do two of these activities. And so in the course of the game, we get more and more tiles onto the board, and we get more and more leaders on the board. If you play a tile, you create a region. So a region is either one tile, or when you place several tiles adjacent to it, then the region simply grows. What turns a region into a kingdom is when you place one or more leaders into that region. And then it's simply a kingdom. And so all the game is about is essentially to fill the board, and to develop the individual regions, turn them into kingdoms, and let the kingdoms grow, get more of the leaders into the kingdoms, and make sure that these kingdoms prosper and take lots of the areas up and um, bring you lots of scores. Well, uh, you'll also notice the one final thing I probably forgot to mention here is there's uh, these white pieces or these natural wood pieces are treasures. There's one in each kingdom. Uh, when the game starts, we'll spend more time on that also. Uh, and finally, the uh, monuments, and we're going to spend some time on that very shortly uh, and explain uh, the significance and how they're scored. Uh, anything else as far as the basics of the game uh, that you want to get to and uh, before we get into the heavy strategy? Yes, you already gave me the, the, the right bullet point here, the natural little woods, natural, natural uh, colored woods. Uh, these are actually important, these are treasures, and they are important for the game end, because the game end will happen when there are only one or two of these treasures left on the board. And you pick these treasures up by building larger kingdoms around them, and as soon as you have more than one of these treasures in a kingdom, then you can actually pick the superfluous treasures up. And that's how actually the game measures itself in how far is the game developed, and if it is really spread out over the whole board, then most of the treasures will be picked up. And then the game decides it's now time to end, and then the game is over, and then you reveal your scores, and then you look at your weakest score, and the person with the best weakest side is the winner. Well, very true. And the other way the game ends is if tiles run out. Now, most of the games I played are, uh, in the beginning, the tiles actually ran out. You yep. were also mentioning that the game can end when all the treasures are gone. Yep. Uh, is that true, though, with that, that normally the game will end because of treasure? Uh, I think when you have more experience and when, when the, the players have played the game several times, the game will usually end through the treasures because people have a clearer focus what they want to achieve. Treasures, to pick up treasures is very, very valuable because they are joker scores. So you can add the treasure to any score or any color you, you are weak, and that means it pushes your weakest one, and that means it's very, very, very good to do that. And therefore, people will focus on that, and it usually accelerates the game end. And of course, it makes it even tighter and more climax towards the end, because you see the end coming, and you see where you're weak, and you want to pick up certain things, and you maybe want to hinder other people from doing certain things. So the speed usually and the dynamics becomes more challenging when people have more experience what they're doing. Very true. 
And that just about concludes uh, our first show on the demonstration of Tigris and Euphrates. I want to thank Reiner for being on hand. We're going to be right back with the second show, so stay tuned. Thanks for watching, everyone.